Hi, welcome to the study of Genesis. I am Cecilia. For more of me, check out my Instagram and also my blog to know more of who I am and what I stand for. So in today's study of Genesis, we're going to look at the person Abraham as we have been looking at him from the chapter from chapter 11 of Genesis and we're still continuing with his story. So far we know that he was called by God and he was promised to to have a son, an heir. And um, we know that by this time in chapter 16, uh, Genesis chapter 16, he has been waiting for 10 years for this son to come or for this son to be born. And we know that Sarai grew... Um, impatient of on waiting on God and thought that uh, to fulfill that promise that God had promised through his sub or her servant Hagar and we know that he told she told Abraham to take Hagar as wife and go into her or uh, have intercourse with her and be able to yeah, produce that promised heir that God had promised them through Hagar and we know that she became pregnant and or she conceived and she became proud you know and looked down on her master Sarai and we know that Sarai complained to Abram and Abram told her that she is your servant, you deal with her as you please. And Sarai was very harsh on her and Hagar had to run for her life or for her safety for her and her unborn child. And she went all the way to the wilderness. So today we're going to look at Genesis chapter 16 verses 7 all the way to 21. And we're going to look at now how the story unfolded after Hagar ran, Hagar ran away from her master Sarai. So let's read what the word of God says. Uh, the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall, be, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was eighty six years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So that is the word of God. So from what we have read out, can we see? We see that Hagar definitely ran away from Sarai after the harsh treatment that she received from her, and she went to the wilderness. And we also see that it is God who sought after her. We are told that the angel of the Lord, uh, you know, came out, came out and saw, yeah, and saw her by the wilderness. And we know that in the Old Testament, when the phrase "the angel of the Lord came" or "the angel of the Lord is used," it is used to refer to the pre-incarnate Christ because the Hebrew word of that uh, sentence or those three words is Malek Yahweh, meaning that the very presence of God. It was not just an angel who was sent by God, but it was God Himself who came down on earth. So we see the representation of Christ Jesus before He was born in the New Testament. Him also was still represented or very present in the Old Testament in the form of God, and He will be referred to as the angel of God of the Lord, meaning also that God Himself was there on earth. So we see that God himself sought after Hagar after he, she ran away to the wilderness. And we also see that the angel of the Lord asked her, where are you from and what are you doing here? You know, inquiring to see whether she recognizes or she notices the reason that brought her to the place or the situation that she found herself in. And she says that she was, she ran, she was running away from her mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord tells her to go back to her mistress and be submissive to her, you know, and listen to her mistress. And, um, yeah, it tells her, God tells Hagar to go back and be submit, submissive to her mistress. And then she, he, be submissive to her mistress. And then he goes again and tells her that she will surely be blessed, that she will bear a son, and that the name of that child should be called Ishmael. Ishmael meaning God hears. So showing that God had her affliction. God had her cry when he ran when she ran to the wilderness and she was there alone, feeling desolate and destitute. Like what is what more is my life? 
going to be like like what more is it for me but god had her and god came and that's why the son is called ishmael and he was also told that she should not worry about the child that she is carrying because he will be great you know he will his offspring will be as many as you know the stars in the sky or will be multiple you know he, he will have a multitude of offspring that it will be like verse 10 says, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And also he was promised that, that um, it was also told that he shall be a wild donkey of a man, you know, how his hands shall be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him and shows that how fierce, you know, and aggressive Ishmael will be when he grows up. And it was seen, you know, in his interactions, you know, the descendants of Ishmaelites and also the descendants of Isaac, how they were fighting back and forth. And also we are told that uh, we can see that similar promise that was given to the son of Sarai, you know, the son of promise was also given to the son of Hagar, you know, Ishmael, that you will also be a multitude of people, he will be great. And we, we also see that Sarai gave thanks to God. He said, you are a God of seeing. You know, because God was able to see her or find her in her affliction. And also we see that Hagar went back to her servant or to her mistress Sarai, that is, she bore a son. And we're told that um, Abraham was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. So we can tell from that that he was 10 years had passed since the promised son that uh, was told to him by God. And he had 10 years later. He has a son, but that is not the promised son. Although he thinks that he is a promised son, but God will later on, as we look at, as we read more, that that is not the promised son that I promised you. Ishmael is not the one. I have taken care of Ishmael. I've given him the blessing. He will not be desolate. He will not be thrown away. He will not be like someone without a father, but he will be great. But he is not the promised son that I have promised you, Abraham. So we see that he was 86 years old. But still, the promised son had not come yet. Ishmael here, he was. And that is what we are getting from the passage that we have just read. So what can we learn from what we have just read? What is the lessons that we can gather from it? First, we see that um, when Hagar ran away, it was God who came after her. It was not Abraham who sent out his servants to look for her or um him, him, he himself going out to look after her. It was not Sarai who went to look after her, to look for her, or sent one of her maid servants to go look for her, but it was God himself. And he did not just send an angel. He came himself to the world to seek her, you know, to show her that I have heard the cry of your affliction. I have heard you in your distress. I am God and I have come to answer you. And God came down. So we see that the first thing we can learn is that God hears us and God had her and God comes down to our level. When you call upon his name, when you cry to him, he comes down to our level and he surely hears us. And we look like we see that it is God who most of the time, if not all the time, he is the one who comes after us when we run away, when we are lost, when we are in distress, when we are in affliction, God usually comes down to us. We have seen that with Abraham, uh, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. We have seen that with um with uh what's his name daniel you know in the in the den of lions it was god who was with him and god is always coming to us we see that also with um jacob while he was fight, fighting with the angel of the lord the whole night and he said i'm not letting you go until you bless me god came down and had in all these people they were in distress they were in affliction they were in a situation where they would rather not be in but they were uh thrown in there but God himself came and answered their prayer. God himself was there with them through that moment of affliction. He was there. He came down. So it is God who comes after us you know, more than we go after him. That's the lesson we are learning. The other lesson we can learn is that God calls her attention to the root of her problems. You know, when God asked her, where, where are you from and why, are, why is it you are here? He was telling you joking her mind or letting her reflect on the reason that brought her here and the reason is that she was being proud or dis disrespectful toward her own mistress after she got she conceived and got a child she thought that she could now look down on sarai because sarai did not have any child and that is what caused her to be chased away or to be harshly treated by her mistress and god is telling her you go back to sarai and be submissive to her 
because you are her servant you know do not be proud not raise yourself so much high that you think that now you can step on her because you're pregnant no she tells her he tells her god tells her to go back and be submissive and that is what lesson you can learn that we should be submissive to our masters to who god has entrusted us to the leadership that we have been entrusted to we should be submissive to them and respect them because that is what god the will of god for us um through our lives so that we do not have pride we don't think that we are higher than everyone we don't think that we are deserving of everything but know that even though we have been blessed those who are ahead of us those who are in leadership or in uh yeah in stations of leaderships for in um on our behalf no for us no <laughs> don't know deserve us to be submissive you know Ephesians chapter 5 says submit to one another out of reverence for Christ so it is the will of God for us to submit to one another and that was the root problem that Hagar had he was she was not submissive to her mistress and uh yeah so she is supposed to go back and be obedient and be respectful towards her mistress the that um lesson that we can learn is that God is gracious towards her towards us and blesses her with similar blessing that was given to the promised child you know god was gracious towards hagar and god also had mercy on hagar that she he came and blessed her with similar promise that was made to abram's son although not particular into detail but similar in terms of uh, him growing into a multitude of people him being many uncountable number him being blessed with much possession it was given to the same the same promise was given to ishmael as it was for isaac even though isaac is not yet born but it was also told to hagar that do not worry about the child do not worry about the safety do not worry about um what will happen you know the gracious god you know the god who hears the god who sees has come down and i will bless your child you know i have heard of your affliction and this child will be great also do not worry about her future or what will happen for uh what will happen to him because probably hagar thought that if i give birth to this child how will sarai treat my child will the child even be able to inherit the um the wealth of abram his father but God is like, do not worry about that. I have sorted that out. Your child will be great too. And we see him being the gracious God, him being the merciful God, you know, him being the God who hears our cry and our affliction. And he is the one who provides for our worries. What we worry about the future, he has already provided for. And that is what we can learn from God, that he blesses us, that he takes care of us and he will take care of our future. And the other thing we can learn is that God presents himself as our refuge. As Hagar ran away into the wilderness, you know, the wilderness means that there is no population there. There are no people there. You are there, you and the wild animals. And you never know if you'll come across, you know, water because he, the place where she was or where Canaan is, is not like a very fertile area where there is rivers and streams of water everywhere. But it could, it, she could find herself in a dry land any time. But here God finds her even in that place deserted place like that god found her there and we see that god is our refuge he was the refuge for hagar and refuge for hagar and her son ishmael and she was able to find comfort she was able to find uh confirmation she was able to find um identity she was able to find peace or to find um confidence that god is with her and god sees her and god is able to hear her even in her time of distress and that is what we are learning that god is our present help in terms of refuge he is the one who offers refuge to us and then this under <laughs> under the shadow of his wings we are able to find refuge in him and that is the god whom we serve and the other thing we can learn from it is that god heard the cry of her affliction of her suffering you know he hears our cry he heard her cry and that's why ishmael is called ishmael because it means god hears God had her cry, the cry for her son, the cry for her son's future, the cry for her future, the cry for how she, how would she be able to raise this, this child. God had every one of those cries and he came and answered them himself and even gave the child the name Ishmael. So God had, God hears and he always does hear the cry of his people. And uh, what else we can 
learn from it is that Hagar praised God. She did not just receive the blessing or she did not just receive the favor of God and ran back to Sarai to boss and be like, oh, you know what? God has seen me. God has blessed me. God will make my child great. Even he has himself given my child a name. But no, she remembered to be thankful, to be grateful. You know, we, we are told that he prayed. she praised God and says, and called the name of that place, God who sees. Um, verse 13, it says, so she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. So she recognized that it is God who looked after her. Those whom she trusted in, you know, her master, her mistress, her fellow servants, none of them came after her to look for her and give her food, give her bread, give her water. None of them came to look after her, but God himself came and looked after her. And she said, surely and truly you are a God who sees because you have heard me in my time of affliction. And she also says that um, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. So she realized then and there that it is only God who looks after her. And she praised God by calling him the God who sees. So remember also in your time of refuge or in your time of liberation or redemption or whatever it is, remember to give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because only he is the one who looks after us. He is our provider. He is our sustainer. So there is no one else. You know, hope can be found in no one else other than God himself who is able to come down to our level because he has heard our cry. You know, he told Moses in the wilderness that I have heard the cry of my people Israel in the land of Egypt. So you have been chosen to go and liberate them. I have chosen you to go and bring my people, lead my people out of Egypt, out of slavery because he heard their cry. And he came and saved them. And also in this present age, God came and became flesh and dwelt amongst us. As John chapter 1 says, that which was from the beginning. No, he says, the beginning was the world and the world was with God and the world was God. And later on, verse 12 says, he says, and the world became flesh and dwelt amongst us. So we have seen the epitome of God himself living and dwelling amongst men. The disciples saw him, the early believers saw him. So we know that he had the affliction of us, you know, the affliction of the how sin is tormenting us, how death is tormenting us. And he came and he conquered sin and he conquered death. And he had our affliction, he liberated us, redeemed us from the chains, from the shackles of this world. So that we may be able to enjoy life, live life free, because whoever the sun sets free, he is free indeed. And that is what the salvation that we receive from God who hears and the God who sees. He saw us and he heard our cry. Even though we did not cry for help, even though we, it seems like we were not even realizing that we are in affliction, but he had it. And he saw it and he came and he became man and he died for our sins. That is the God who serves, the God who sees. The other lesson we can learn is that what God promised Hagar to Ishmael to be. Um, the other thing we can learn from that passage is that what God promised Hagar came to be with the birth of Ishmael, you know. He was born and he was named Ishmael, just as the angel of the Lord, God himself, told Hagar. So his word is true. His promises are sure. He never lies. Let us want to. His promises will surely come to pass. The God who sees and the God who hears keeps his word. And that is what we can learn from the passage that we've just read. Then how can we apply the verses that we have read to our day-to-day -day lives or to our day-to-day -day work in salvation? Firstly, we know that God does hear us when we cry. In our affliction, he hears us. I cannot explain it enough. He hears us. You know, he never sleeps. He never slumbers. You know, he never goes out for a walk and forgets his people. He's always ready to come to our rescue. He hears us in everything. He sees everything in our lives, you know. Psalms 139, David says that, Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I hide from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shield, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell the utmost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and the right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night. Even darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. 
it clearly shows david clearly expresses that there is no way we can hide from god there is nowhere god cannot see high in the heaven he sees deep in sheol he sees very much to the east he sees to the west he sees in the very darkest part of the night he's still able to see you know you think that probably in it was at night god did not see no he saw he sees everything he hears everything and that is the god whom we serve the other thing we can apply to our life he is the only redeemer he came and he redeemed Hagar. He rescued Hagar from the oppression, from the affliction that she was going, you know, from the desolate, desolation that she was experiencing and restored her back to her master and gave her back hope that the sun will become great. And he is already redeemer right now, knowing that he's able to take us from the bondage of sin. He's able to take us from the ways of the world, you know, the corrupt ways of this world. And he is able to redeem us back into a relationship with him so that we know that he is able now to see us clearly and hear us clearly because we have connection with him we have relationship with him no longer are we waiting for the judgment that is to come but we know that we have been liberated and we have been set free from any um uh, repercussions that comes with our sin we have been set free because jesus christ died for our sin so we know and we can believe that he is the only redeemer he is our redeemer that has been sent to us that he himself came down in the form of man and redeemed us he had us and he came down and uh, the other thing we can apply is that we are to obey our masters, the ones that God has set above us. The same way Paul wrote to Philemon and also told um, Onesimus about it, that go back to your master and be submissive to him. The same way Paul writes also in Ephesians chapter 6 that um, born servants should be Bond servants should be respectful and obedient to their masters. And also masters should be obedient to their bond servants or be... Um, lenient to their bond servants because we all have one master and that is jesus christ so we know that from it from this story of hagar being told to go back to he to her mistress and be submissive to her we know that we also should be submissive to those whom god has set above us to the laws to the government to our uh, parents to our leaders whatever workplace or whatever situation that we find ourselves in we are to be submissive to them in everything that we do because that is the will of god that we should submit to one another out of reverence for Christ because we're submitting not as we're submitting man, but we are submitting as if we're submitting to God Himself because we are the servants of God. He is our master. Once you have been saved, He becomes your Lord and He becomes your Savior. So Him being Lord, meaning that in whatever I am doing, I'm doing it as, a, as if I'm doing it for the Lord, as it being it is written in the Word of God. The other uh, part that you can apply is that only God is our refuge in times of trouble. He is the only one you can run to. So when you are in trouble or when you're in distress, who is the first person you go to? You see, your phone, you go to your phone and look at who is in my first, uh, my my dial, uh, who do I call um, most of the time, who do I lean on in terms of trouble. Most of us, we have friends, we have family that we that are the first person we call to. We call on to, they're the first person we think, ah, if I'm in trouble, this is the person I'm going to call. But do you call on God first? Do you rely on God first? Is God your first option? Or is he the last after I have tried all others? But from what we are seeing, that it is, he is the only one who can see us in a time of distance. He's the only one who can hear us when we cry to him or when we cry in our affliction. And he is the only one who comes first. He came first for Hagar. He came first even to redeem us from our sins. So he is the one who is also able to come first in the time that we are struggling right now. So is he your first option? I pray that he is your first option because only he is our refuge. Only he is able to liberate us in our distress. He is the only person we can run to. No one else is able to come after us the same way God has come after us. Each and every time we have failed, each and every time we have gone against him, each and every time we have found ourselves in times of trouble, he is the one who came first, not anyone else. So make sure he is the first person, the first option you hold on to or you call to when you are in trouble and the last thing we can apply is that god god's promises are true he has promised comfort for all those who are suffering we know from the beatitudes that blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted and that promise is true you know paul also writes and say that we have been comforted that's why we are able to comfort others because of the comfort that we received from god 
him because it is true that he is our only comfort. He is the only one who can comfort us because he understands everything that we have gone through. He understands because he was tempted in every way like we are yet without sin. He went through all the tests that we are going through. He went through all the troubles of this world. He understands it in very deep, in deep detail. Because him, he went through all that, not because of what he had done, not because of the sin he had committed, not because he had wronged anyone, but he went through all of them. So he understands it more um, deeply than we think he does. And he is the one who can give us the most comfort that we need. So run to Jesus Christ, run to God, and you will see the comfort that he has promised in his word. Because blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And I pray that you have learned something from the study of Genesis today. And if there's anything else that I've not mentioned, be sure to write it down in the comment section below. And so that you may